I'm alive. Uh, I shouldn't be. He should not be alive. This is unfucking believable. <laughs> From the heart of trucker America, my boy Reed Coverdale, host of the Naturalist Capitalist. This is what government does. It sucks. If you think you're going to win people over by stating commonplaces, you're just selling the other part. It is about dictating every transaction that you have for the rest of your life, Mr. Potato Head. Coverdale is the guy to be president of the United States. You intimidated me with your perfect 74 staff. That was the beginning of my problem. He died doing what he loved, chasing a minor. But I'll put a 50 cal attached to my suburban. Libertarians need to get out of New York. The right. gulag is going to be in your house. This guy's a fucking murderer. He deserves to be in a yeah, gun. You that truck at night and get him into the White House. Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of The Naturalist Capitalist. I appreciate the continued support from everyone. Make sure you check out all my other platforms linked in the description of this video, or if you're listening to it on, you know, in podcast format, I will have the links there as well. Follow me at all those places because you never know how long I'm going to stick around. Uh, today, I got a great guest. Um, I've been talking with him quite a bit, actually, for the last couple months through Facebook and Twitter when I still had Twitter. Uh, he's a journalist, filmmaker. He's a creator of the documentary series, A Very Heavy Agenda, three-part series that I just watched. It's very good. We'll be getting into it. And he's the co-host of Media Roots with Abby Martin, who I had on the show last year, her brother, Robbie Martin. Robbie, how are you doing today, man? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me on, Reed. Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, I really appreciate the angle that you and Abby come from because you guys are definitely more left wing than me, but I don't view you guys as like unhinged socialists who never, you know, go outside your echo chamber. You've been on the Ron Paul Liberty Report. Uh, I know Abby supported Ron Paul in 2008 and, you know, there's been lots of crossover and I think we're just kind of able to focus on, you know, the really important issues and kind of put the cultural stuff to the side. Not that it doesn't matter, but, you know, not let it obstruct us from, uh, you know, having coalition based causes on the biggest issues of our time. Um, but why don't you just give a little intro uh, to yourself? Like, what have you been doing the last, you know, the, la the, the last tons of years that you've been uh, involved in political activism? Sure. Um, I mean, recently I've kind of gone off on this totally bizarre, unrelated tangent to my n to normal work. I've become pretty focused on artificial intelligence. Um, and I, I first started focusing on it, not from a political angle, um, just for as an artist. Um, I was pretty excited and interested in sort of this whole visual art um artificial intelligence world that's sort of emerging right now which is if people don't know about it um I mean, if you're a visual artist or if you're a person into visual art i highly recommend just checking out some videos or things about it because it's accelerating at a pretty insane rate um you know i'd always been someone who thought that like you know things like the singularity or or ai gaining sentience would be sort of a a big pivotal moment in society that we'd all, you know, be scared or in astonishment over. But uh, it turns out that these other, some of these other aspects of AI are causing very, in in my opinion, very fast um, sweeping changes that aren't sentient at all. Uh, but, you know, like a, a, a Google engineer got tricked into thinking their GPT-3 model uh, which was like a chat bot was sentient because that's how good it is. Um, it has zero sentience whatsoever, but it's it's trained basically on all of the text on the entire Internet. So you can imagine that something that, you know, has that much text in it would probably seem very human like to someone who's trying to talk to it just based on it knowing, you know, every conversation that's ever been posted online. But anyways, that's sort of a you know, that's not why I came on to, on your show uh to talk today but um that's something i've been more invested in recently in terms of like the political implications of that the angle of that because um i'm not sure if you're familiar with the company open ai uh it was it was sort of co-founded by peter Thiel, elon musk and some of these same people that i think you and i have talked about a little bit who sort of you know stunt as they act like they're libertarians but 
in reality, it, it almost seems more like that's kind of a, an image that they cultivate for themselves. So there's there's an interesting angle to all this. But um, I mean, mostly over the past couple of years, uh, I have been pretty focused on like the anthrax, um, 2001 anthrax attacks um, after the 20th anniversary of 9-11 came along. Um, I got pretty fixated again on researching not just 9-11 again and taking a, a, another look at it but also the anthrax attacks that followed 9 11 uh, a little over a month later or under a month later and though i mean to me those attacks have always been sort of uh like i feel like they're part of the same operation if you will so uh i wanted to take a look at them together again um you know after sort of not deep diving on it for a few years and and i found in my opinion some really important uh stuff that sort of take t has taken me in completely new directions with those attacks um for example um stephen hatfill uh at, you know after looking at all the information again uh you know and hadn't looked at it for a long time i i'm i'm more open to the possibility that he is not as innocent as he was portrayed and that he may even gotten people in alt media to sort of run a disinformation counter war for him, um, if you will. So there's a lot of weird angles to it that I think need to be more explored. But I mean, probably the most important thing I found, um, if anyone's interested in looking at the 2001 anthrax attacks, is uh, me and another researcher named Gumby for Christ, who does really good uh, research on Twitter. We found a... Um, basically a piece of physical evidence we don't have it in our possession we don't actually have it but we have a photograph of it uh which is an envelope from the anthrax attacks letter attacks uh that at least for me and several other people who have seen this basically proves that bruce ivans uh, couldn't have been the sole perpetrator of the attacks this one single piece of evidence alone kind of throws a wrench in the entire idea that he was uh, sole perpetrator so you know if you think he was involved or not that's another debate but the idea that he acted alone um is basically impossible at this point according to the evidence i found so that's probably the biggest thing i've been doing over the last couple of years um but of course i'm always tracking neocons and you know after the trump era uh, as you know a lot of those neocons have sort of um, of course, a lot of them became like liberal interventionists or liberals like Bill Crystal and whatnot. But then a lot of the other ones sort of became these sort of phony right populists um, who are, you know, obsessed with China. And uh, so that's been kind of a general focus of mine for the past, uh, I don't know, three or four years. <clears throat> By the way, can you see me now? Am I showing up on the yeah, screen? Yeah, right. I can. Yeah, yeah. apparently yeah. that was uh, on my side because I got a bunch of comments in the live stream saying uh, okay. my camera wasn't working, <laughs> but we're good now. Uh, yeah, so speaking of neocons infiltrating, you know, different appearances and different political movements to, you know, keep spreading their ideology, I just finished watching all three uh, episodes of a very heavy agenda that you put out. First of all, very well put together. Lots of political documentaries are really boring to watch, but I never got bored the entire time. It was uh, lots of good information put together in a very uh, artistic way. So I've got that linked in the description. I would recommend everyone go check that out on Vimeo. You just got to pay like $6 or something. You can watch all three episodes. Um, but yeah, the, the first thing I wanted to talk about was that the warmongering against Russia that we're seeing right now comes from mostly the same group of people who were involved with Project for New American Century, pushing us into war with Iraq. And then they kind of rebranded themselves a little bit to push for this new Cold War with Russia. Um, but I think most people who watch my show are familiar with PNAC and the Clean Break and the reasoning for getting into the Iraq war. But why don't you just give us a quick breakdown of what those two things are and who the people behind those, uh, you know, the think tank and the strategy were. Sure. I mean, it may be sort of perplexing for people to look back on all this now and, and say, well, what do you mean the project for the new American century neocons are the ones who got us into, you know, this new conflict with Russia? 
because people's perception now and rightfully so is that it's almost like the entire democratic party and almost like the entire establishment that is behind uh the war in ukraine it almost doesn't seem like there's a particular group or click it's a it's a very large swath of of dc um so i think one of the most the important takeaways from the movie is that it was these project for the new american century neocons who were very ahead of the curve and they were gunning for russia and trying to figure out a way to pivot to russia as a new adversary after the end of the cold war very very early on during bill clinton um before 9 11 uh they foresaw this idea of this basically this missed opportunity if you will of the cold war ending it's like the cold war enabled you know sort of the military industrial complex and this neocon machinery to operate pretty seamlessly it, it was it had a reason to keep pushing the envelope to keep pushing for mission creep in all these different areas of the world to undermine communism or whatever and now that was gone so on some level it's like these people knew that they needed another excuse or that they needed something to as an engine to propel their war making desires and um and i think one of the you know one thing i discovered while making these films is that nato expanded something like I, I don't want to say twofold because I think that that's probably not accurate, but it expanded quite significantly in the nineties, like after the Soviet union collapsed during the Clinton era. And I think that that sort of just shows how many, you know, pieces were being put in place, how many things were in motion to sort of get this apparatus going very early on. So, you know, that was coming from within um, the U S government. So it wasn't, you know, specifically just these neocons moving that at the time. But what they did was after, you know, Project for the New American Century, after the Bush era, the same people who were behind that, and for people who don't know what Project for the New American Century is, it's the infamous neocon think tank that uh, recommended or basically said that we need a new uh, Pearl Harbor, a catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor to be able to get all these things that we wanted to do after 9-11. So what they did was they kind of had their reputation sort of damaged during the Bush era, just like any of the really ultra hawk, you know, pro Iraq war ideologues during the Bush era. They I would say they're sort of had their reputations damaged and tarnished to a certain extent. And I think that they sort of already must have been aware that this was going to happen to them because you know, right when the Obama administration started, uh, they already had a, a new think tank uh, with all the same people, largely the same group of people who was in Project for the New American Century, starting a think tank called the Foreign Policy Initiative. And Bill Kristol and Robert Kagan, the same two, you know, founders of Project for the New American Century, founded this. And its explicit purpose was to start to confront rising and resurgent powers in the world like china and russia it's the very explicit uh reasoning for this think tank existing and sort of under the radar reason for it existing is you know uh we we like obama like we want to encourage him we don't you know we we like that he's more hawkish on these things than than other Democrats, and we want to encourage him, and we want we want to sort of steer him and and help him, you know, achieve these foreign policy goals. So for the first, <clears throat> I would say, first three years of Obama's presidency, this think tank, the Foreign Policy Initiative, uh, Bill Kristol, Robert Kagan, they were pretty encouraging of and not critical of the Obama administration. In fact, Obama was reading. Uh, Robert Kagan's book, The World America Made, uh, as he's entering the White House. You know, they, there's all these news stories about what books is Obama reading when he's getting into office? He's reading Team of Rivals, you know, the book about Lincoln. Well, he was also reading The World America Made by Robert Kagan, which is sort of a almost like a neocon swan song about how it's like, well, we may, you know, it's like America is like 
heavy handed and has done like messed up shit over time, but it's like we're we're still the best and like we are still like uh the arbiters of like world peace. So we got to do what we got to do, guys. Like that's the that's essentially the the theme of the world America made. And uh you know, in in my movie I show a certain turning point where it almost seems like Obama decided very very subtly, I would say, to put on the brakes of the neocon agenda that he was essentially letting being fed into his administration. And that all sort of culminated with first Syria, the Syria red line back down. And then uh, when Ukraine happened um, under the Obama administration, he, he refused for some reason. It's still not clear. He still really never explained it publicly, but he refused to sign into law the $300 million dollars big first weapon supplemental for the Ukraine war. So that sent a signal to the neocons um, that this president was basically like putting the brakes on this war to a certain extent. And it was to us, it was just in such a way that they actually like turned against him. And I think people really ought to go back. It's not just in my film, but just in general to see that it wasn't just the establishment that decided they hated Trump when Trump got in office, it was actually in a strange way. They decided they started to dislike Obama towards the end of his presidency. And it sort of continued on the theme of Obama pulling away from the Ukraine war and trying to make deals with Putin became like this really aggravating thing to people, certain people in the establishment, certain neocons that it almost like exploded when Trump came into the picture. And I strongly believe that that you could really see a, a, a total continuation of what Obama was doing and the people gunning for him and those same people gunning for Trump when he's, you know, started to become, uh, uh, you know, it's trying to talk about being like a peacenik with Russia. Um, and, you know, if I, if I had an opportunity to do a part four of a very heavy agenda, it would be obviously all about Russia gate. And I mean, there's so many, the story, I had no idea when I made these films that like Russia like paranoia would get to the fever pitch that it did. So it was quite bizarre, uh, you know, after the fact, because when I made them, it was almost like a niche, almost like fringe topic that most people didn't even care that much about, except for, you know, heads like you or, or people who are like really into foreign policy stuff, but regular people like barely were paying attention. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was, it's weird to now that it's became like so mainstream, you know, but yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting to me that Robert Kagan and Bill Crystal, you know, they obviously supported Bush and then they supported Romney and McCain against Obama. But then they were they were willing to completely leave the Republican Party over Trump getting nominated. What 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 about Trump do you think was so much more off putting to them, even though Obama had especially in 2008, he sort of had this anti-Bush message, this more um, humble foreign policy message, but they weren't willing to like completely abandon him. They kind of tried to encourage him in the in the right direction. Why did they not bother with Trump at all, do you think? I mean, that's a really, really good question. And it's one that I that I still, you know, try to understand. Um, I, you know, I think this is when I have to get a little conspiratorial and, and put on a, a, a tinfoil hat and, and say that I think after all this has happened, what's become really evident to me on some level, I think that what Trump represented was sort of an inner factional deep state war. Um, and, you know, the term deep state has almost become rendered meaningless now in the Trump era. But I really do think there are opposing forces of bad actors who do really sketchy, illegal, and, you know, things that would basically be equatable to a serial murder. And they are at odds with each other in and outside of government. Um, and when I, by that, that I mean that I think people like, you know, maybe even Michael Flynn, Rudy Giuliani, some of these people who are more kind of the more fringy characters in Trump's administration, I do think they represent some kind of faction of deep state um, behavior. And then on the other side, you might have people like Crystal and Kagan and Wolfowitz, um, who are representing another faction. And then even sometimes you seem to have crossover where it's like, which side is James Woolsey on? Which side is, 
Elliot Abrams on? Which side is McMaster on? Which side is John Bolton on? And then you right. kind of have to wonder, well, are there really two distinct sides of this or is it just sort of a almost like an implosion or a collapse of that internal deep state system whatever that is that it, where it's like it maybe it's just unsustainable in the sense that it's like they start going at each other at a certain point i it's very hard honestly to explain but that's um that's one of the best things i come up with honestly is like trump somehow represented this other factions team gaining power and that was a threat to that the other team and i by that i don't mean republican democrat at all so um you know but then again trump did do a lot of things that were really beneficial to people like bill crystal and robert kagan in the long run so on okay. the other hand i do wonder how much of this was all for show you know how much is Bill Crystal really a liberal? How much does he really hate Trump? I don't know. I mean, I don't know how earnest it really is. I, I, so part of me wonders, you know, was Trump almost kind of like used as an excuse by a lot of these people? Like he was like a Casas Belli, like sort of 9-11 like event in of himself to just, you know, do all this other horrendous stuff. Like look at what Bill Crystal's uh, think tank, the Alliance for Securing Democracy sort of kickstarted with censorship and, tracking disinformation i mean that was uh very ahead of the curve and kind of got born out of the you know the trump era so regardless of what they say about how much they hate trump or not i think that like what's really born out has benefited them overall so um that the question about why they you know acted like they hate trump or they really hate trump i can't answer that so ultimately <laughs> Yeah, no, it, uh, watching the third episode of your documentary covering the 2016 Republican primary, I thought it was very well done because I feel like the Trump campaign is, you know, inaccurately depicted nowadays as though it was some type of anti-war campaign. And I thought you were very exact in how you pointed out no he was this was not an anti-war campaign he wanted to bomb the shit out of isis he wanted to kill terrorist families there were a couple things like about the iraq war and putin that the neocons didn't like about him but rand paul was the obvious you know more anti-interventionist candidate in that race what's interesting is after he won you know like mike pompeo ended up getting on board with him like he was against him at first and then he was like all right well he won whatever and then he even had john bolton as uh secretary of defense when john bolton was part of pnac so it's not like just because robert kagan and bill crystal you know abandoned the republican party over him that there was this massive exodus of every single warmonger from the republican party to the democrat party and i feel like a lot of you know, even some libertarians and even some progressives act like that's what happened, that after Trump won, the Republican Party became the anti-interventionist party and all the neocons and all the warmongers went over to the Democrat Party. I think that's a very black and white, unrealistic position, as you illustrated. Well, that's the thing that I, I almost I was almost worried after I put out my movie that I was going to reinforce that black and white paradigm that you just laid out, because. I tried in my movie to show how nuanced it actually is and how it's not as black and white and how it's not as like this team or the other as you may think it is. I mean, even Obama, who I perceive as being a huge warmonger and a neocon, you know, for the most of his presidency, um, was got quite a lot of backlash. You, you know, like people do not remember that even Victoria Newland, you know, one of his own appointees basically accuses him of like aiding genocide in Syria, right? When she leaves his administration because he didn't yeah. go far enough in Syria. I mean, it's you you realize how crazy these people really are. It's like Obama didn't kill enough people, you know, for these people. He didn't destroy Libya enough. You know, it's like um, but yeah, no, you're right. It, it is there has become an oversimplified narrative now. And I think it's very beneficial, obviously, to the Republican Party. It's a great rebranding exercise for them to be like, yeah, we're the anti-war, you know, party now. Um, and all the, you know, all the neocons, they went into the, the Democratic Party. Um, I mean, it's technically, it's not true. I mean, a lot of those 
Republicans, you know, it's like they were, you know, they would have been easily classified as neocons pre Trump era. They just kind of stopped talking about <laughs> a lot of them just stopped talking about like foreign policy and just kind of remain mum so that you can kind of have this maybe impression, I guess, by omission that they're not neocon. I mean, it's it's kind of ridiculous, actually, because the only one like the only ones that are maybe actually anti neocon ones are like ones that barely get any attention, like Justin Amash or, you know, Thomas Massey. Uh, and the ones that do get a bunch of attention are like basically like lunatic, like QAnon or people like Marjorie Taylor Green. So it's funny yeah. that, you know, the principled ones, they just sort of get no attention. And it's like even it's even funny. I even see leftists being like Marjorie Taylor Green did it again. She's like she's railing against the Ukraine war. And it's like, why don't you guys ever talk about like Justin Amash? Like, why are you talking about her? She's fucking all over the place. Like, not, I mean. Um, so I don't know. I mean, there's a, I'm just going off a total tangent now, but back to what you said. Yes, there is an oversimplification that I hope that people, when people watch my film, they don't take that away from it because yeah, I mean, it's, um, everything's every, I mean, the thing now is both parties are warmongers. Um, yeah. And I think that that's essentially what probably the goal was is like, you know, uh, get one side to hate Russia and gun for Russia and get the other side to hate China. I mean, it, it's kind of almost like a perfect setup and that's what we're seeing now. So. Yeah, no, that's a hundred percent true. And I, I don't think your film made it look that way. I thought it was one of the few sources I've seen that accurately depicted the situation. The, you know, it's always Biden isn't, you know, warmongering enough. He needs to put troops on the ground in uh, in Ukraine and he shouldn't have pulled out of Afghanistan. We should have stayed. Same with Trump. Like he should have just done regime change in Iran instead of stepping down. Like all the horrible stuff that you and I disagree with Biden or Trump or Obama, all these guys are always saying they're not doing enough. So it's like a worse it's a bad and worse thing. And it kind of goes back and forth. So the idea that one side's good one side's bad is ridiculous. What is really disappointing to me, though, is there are like no anti-war Democrats left. I mean, that's amazing. And, you know, yeah. under Trump, when they were leading the charge against the war in Yemen, you know, only like two or three years ago or three or I don't know, three or four years ago now, I guess that was incredible. And, you know, it seemed like, OK, we still got some progressives who are upset about us fighting these wars, but now they're, you know, Bernie Sanders, AOC, Ro Khanna, they're all voting to send billions of dollars into Ukraine. It's just, to me, that's the real tragedy is there's like no institutional representation for anti-war left-wingers anymore. That's really sad. Well, inside, I mean, inside holding office, uh, you're absolutely Correct. right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the thing is, it's like the, the actual leftist anti-war groups strangely are almost like marginalized by the online, like sort of Twitter left. <laughs> like you almost don't hear very much about groups like PSL or like the actual anti-war protesting groups uh, because they're, they're not online as much. And, you know, a lot of the anti-imperialists and, and Twitter leftists online, uh, for some reason they don't promote those, you know, the kind of like street actions and actual war protests very much. Um, so it kind of has the effect of making people feel as if there's just nothing happening on the left. And I mean, in, in office, um, yeah, it's dismal, man. I mean, probably the last good person was Dennis Kucinich, maybe. I mean, as far as a Democrat goes. And um, I mean, honestly, he even started to say things that were kind of weird to me. Like he, not that I don't, I don't think it was from him going on Fox News, but like, you know, as he sort of may, and I don't know how public he is anymore, like with his, with his punditry and stuff, but it's like, I don't know what his deal was, but yeah, he like, when he left office, he started saying some weird stuff that I didn't really agree with as much anymore. But I mean, in general, like he was, he was the, probably the greatest last hope, um, you know, there. And I mean, there's some confrontation videos between him and I think you probably saw in my film people like Eric Edelman and, and others where I'm just like, dude, this guy was on fire. Like there, yeah. as far as you, it's he probably did that so much to the Bush administration. They probably hated him. There's probably someone in a room somewhere who's like, how do we get rid of this guy? Like, what do we, you know, I mean, 
Uh, I don't even know if Ron Paul really got that aggressive ever in people's faces, you know, like that in Congress. Yeah. Dennis Kucinich had this like, it's almost like he could turn on the mean in a way that was sort of like kind of surprising. This little guy, you know, could like make people in the Bush administration nervous, you know, and it's, it's, you just don't see anything like that anymore. Not nothing like that. Um, and I think, you know, part of the problem I have with a lot of these right populist, supposedly anti-war people in Congress is I just I get the sense that it's much more performative than, you know, what you see of like a Dennis Conf Kucinich confrontation of the past. It feels like they know it's it's going to get them political points to say yeah. things, certain things about Ukraine. And it just doesn't feel it doesn't feel authentic it feels like ted cruz yelling at mark zuckerberg you know it's like about censorship it's like does he really care because i don't right. think he does you know so <laughs> yeah but anyways <laughs> no that, that's totally true i mean because there's tons of political will right now to be against the war in ukraine from like a large minority is like why are we doing this it's when you see people taking a principled stance when it's completely unpopular like when we're you know air striking Soleimani and for you know some people tons of people think we should do that when you see people like saying no this is stupid this is reckless when something like that is happening or like the war in Iraq when there was tons of political will to go ahead with it when you see people stand against it in those times that's when you know it's really um it's really ad you know really all about principle it's not just advantageous to their image because you see tons of people do that now with all sorts of things um, right. well, I wanted to mention really quickly, just in case, I don't know if you remember, I mean, you probably saw them in my film, but for people who watch your show, I'm assuming some of them maybe are a little more right-leaning, the L Lincoln Chaffee, uh, a Republican yeah. from the Iraq war era, he was on fire too. I mean, like he was, he was railing against Wolfowitz and Bush and in ways that probably only really rivaled Kucinich and it's kind of interesting that no one remembers him. You know, every, a lot of people remember more the Democrats who went to the dark side, like Zell Miller and, you know, the guy who looked like Freddy Krueger at the RNC, who was like a previous Democrat. And then now he's just like railing against Saddam Hussein or Lieberman, you know, who, who went from being a Democrat to like a neocon hawk supporter of the Iraq war. But people don't remember that he was a Republican pretty generic Republican who just was like all of a sudden, like, this is egregiously wrong. Like, why are we yeah. doing this? There's no weapons there. I mean, it was like, he was saying, when you look back at these videos, you're like, damn, like he really could see through it all. So it wasn't like, you know, everybody got the wool pulled all over their eyes. They, you know, they, they thought, Oh, they thought they had weapons. No, that was all, that's all bullshit. Of course, people, anybody at the time who wasn't like taken by like sort of the Bush fascist, you know force would have been able to see like yeah this is obvious bs like well, this is crazy um yeah so yeah well, anyways what about like stephen colbert because watching that <laughs> documentary put together it's so disappointing it's just like man he yeah. was so good back then and then even like rachel maddow had moments where it was like wow she's calling out know, right? the neoconservative think tank and now they're just both their propaganda their their propaganda arms of the administration now and so do you think they sold out or they just got you know, desensitized to it all, or they're just morons, or what, what do you think happens with all these people? Wow. Well, I mean, Stephen Colbert, I'll just, I'll just talk about him first because he's sure. a comedian. He, I never saw him as someone who was, you know, I guess I, I remember being a fan of John Stewart during the Bush administration, but I always, uh, I was always frustrated that he wouldn't go far enough. I, I never saw eye to eye with his politics, but I remember when Colbert came on, I was like, actually, this is like more of a cutting satire of this. You know, it almost seemed like it was making fun of like Hannity or something when it came, when it first was on the air, but in a way that was so deadpan accurate, like that it, it was, I, I think a lot of people actually did not get it when it first came on the air. I remember trying to show it to some people and watching it with like my wife's parents and they, they didn't even know what was happening. Like they were confused. They didn't realize it was like a, so I think it was actually a really clever show when it was first on. And I mean, he's, he was really cutting in the things that he would say. Uh, he confronted Bill Crystal. 
really con cutting ways. He confronts Robert Kagan. He confronts Dan Senor. Um, and very, I mean, honestly, very impressive to go back and watch some of those, those interviews that he did. Um, and yeah, you know, I think what happened with him was very simple. What happened with a lot of other celebrities uh, from the time, which was, you know, this almost like what the Obama campaign did was it, it reached out to a lot of people in the Hollywood and celebrity class and kind of made them feel like they were in the inner circle all of a sudden. And that included obscure celebrities like, um, you know, like Colbert or other yeah. people like musicians who maybe weren't as famous at the time. Um, you know, lots of uh, black musicians who weren't like in the top five, you know, billboard charts. The Obama, the Obama administration really did sort of reach out to this sort of Hollywood or celebrity class in a way that um, I don't think anyone else had done before. And I think Colbert, he was literally, they, I mean, they literally did a USO show where they shave Colbert's head live on, on TV and Obama orders him to shave his head. Um, and that was according to Colbert, a funny, he thought that was a smart and funny satirical sketch to do. Um, you know, when I watched that, I was like, Oh my God, this is like, it's like almost like he's killing Colbert. Like this is mm -hmm. like a symbolic, like live execution <laughs> of a like, beloved character. Yeah. And it was because it's after that he, he, I mean, he broke, he broke the character multiple times to actually like indirectly praise Obama. And I remember when I first would see that, I'm like, this is trash. Like you ruin, you're literally ruining the entire concept of this show. So yeah. I think that's what happened to him. And I think he just, you know, becomes more of a generic lib as he gets older. Maybe someone like Maddow though, she's harder to pin down. I mean, one of the odd things about her is she was mentored by Tucker Carlson. They're still really great friends. Um, are they still and, really great friends? They are. Apparently so. Wow. Apparently so. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's weird. You know, Tucker talks a big game about hating MSNBC and the neocons, but he's also good friends with George W. Bush still. He he went over to dinner at his house, um, I think, like seven or eight months ago wow. in Martha's Vineyard. Uh but the Rachel Maddow thing is interesting because, yeah, she was actually one of the only MSNBC hosts talking about neocons during the Obama administration. Uh, and I know this because I scoured every conceivable TV clip you can imagine to find anything from that era of people talking about neocons. And she was one of the only ones. And so was Matt Duss, a guy who is now associated with sort of neoliberal excuse making with, you know, bad foreign policy decisions. Um, and he, he basically infiltrated the new PNAC uh, and it was giving a report about how bad it was. Um, and you even see, I thought one of the most interesting clips of Rachel Maddow that I included was her talking about how Bill Crystal wants to um, exacerbate the Ukraine war and how it's the neocons are doing it again, just like they did in Iraq, just like they did with Afghanistan or, you know, whatever. Now they're doing it again in Ukraine. Um, so to see that is, is just really interesting because it's like, how, when did she change her mind uh, that Ukraine was was a worthy war? I mean, she's literally equating it to like the, you know, war propaganda like the neocons pushed with Iraq. So it's interesting. Um, but if you notice that she's she's taking a, a stance in that segment saying that, like, they're trying to push Obama, like she's still kind of defending Obama and putting the blame on them, you know, specifically. Um, right. but it's fascinating because even she and other people from her network didn't, didn't continue with that stance when Obama decided to not vote for the, uh, supplemental, the, the 300 million, they actually kind of went the opposite direction and started to act like Obama was wrong and that he was sort of letting Putin get the best of them. And it's, it, so it's weird to see even her network turn in that direction and kind of act like you know, Obama's being too much of a pussy, basically, against Putin. Um, and that was MSNBC's stance as he exited his administration. Yeah. You were talking about how <clears throat> Obama sort of made the the talk show hosts and the media feel like they were welcome, like they were one of them now. Um, and what I thought was really interesting about your documentary was uh, outlining how Vice News... Yeah 
rose to popularity because I honestly didn't know any of that. Um, like I might be completely wrong, but when I think of Vo uh, of uh, Vice News, like I always think it's like some liberal, edgy show or something. I haven't watched it much. I think that's probably what most people think. But mm -hmm. you outlined how they created this show designed to turn young people into warmongers, basically. And watching how you laid it out, I can't really disagree, but I was wondering if you could pontificate on that a little bit. How did they... I mean, because it's Rupert Murdoch and Bill Maher and a lot of the people that you, I was surprised to see are actually behind bringing this show uh, to light and getting at all the numbers it has. So just tell us a little bit about that. Well, so, I mean, I, I know I'm, I'm from the Bay Area and I remember uh, Vice Magazine being very popular when it first arrived. And one of the most interesting things about Vice that I don't think people remember is that it was free. Now not saying anything uh, m there's anything meant behind that to say that it was subsidized by government or anything like that but i i look back on vice magazine's history and i you know i always think wow that magazine was really lucky for being able to have enough money to make itself free i mean that's a very rare thing for a full color print magazine to be distributed freely um i think very, you know that's an incredible luck that they had um, starting out. So, you know, and I remember opening Vice magazine and seeing stuff about like, you know, uh, anal sex and just like pictures of like, you know, full frontal nudity. It would be like, it was a very edge Lord, you know, it, I, I wouldn't say it was politically left, but it was definitely like culturally liberal, right. very edgy. Um, and I didn't know who Gavin McGinnis was at the time. I didn't, I didn't know anything about him, but I remember just, honestly just being kind of grossed out by it thinking like i don't like the vibe of this um you know i'm not like offended by edginess but i just feel like this is like trying too hard like i it's, it's it was lame to me so then years later is when they started the you know the vice network and i didn't really think too much of it either i remember just thinking you know it seems kind of exploitative like it i remember just being annoyed by the fact that it would they would go to other countries and then like be like look at how like filthy, you know, this, this ghetto is in this country and look how, you know, look what these people are eating. They're, they're in such poverty. It had sort of this exploitative, like almost like adventure tourism vibe to me that just turned me off. Like it wasn't because of the politics. I just remember thinking this just feels, it just feels unethical or something about it. I didn't like. Um, and then when I started researching stuff for this film, I had remembered a few different Vice segments that I randomly caught. And I remember thinking, you know, that was really odd that Vice seemed so on that. You know, in between these subjects about Shane Smith going to look at all the shit on the beach in, like, Liberia or whatever, um, they, were, they would do, like, a segment about, like, the Russian gay law. You know, there'd be, like, a really deep cut, uh, really seemingly deep investigative thing. Or they would do a whole thing about, you know, Ru the Russia and Georgian border and how Russia is secretly digging a, a boring a tunnel right underneath so that they can like expand their border or something very obscure. And I remember, I remember even thinking at the time, like why would vice be covering this stuff so heavily? Like Russia is not even like in the news barely at all right now. Like what is going on? So I just remember having those passing thoughts. And when I went back and researched it for my film, it became just really obvious to me that, there was some sort of agenda at vice to uh to cover this subject very very heavily to be basically probably the most thorough news network there was covering the russian gay law um which on the surface nothing seems odd about that they're a liberal you know outlet it's it's culturally important to young people here especially um but it became more obvious to me that there was something where it was like it was almost like they were chipping away, chipping away, chipping away at the idea that Russia was even like had any potential of being good to the point where it's almost like now they were starting to look like you know this evil Soviet Union like country again that was also virulently homophobic, right? And I don't agree with the gay law personally, but the amount of coverage and focus it was getting from Vice and from other American media outlets was let's say that it was disproportionate and 
it didn't seem organic to me. It was similar to how all of a sudden in the U.S. we got all this coverage about Uyghurs, and then it just sort of died down. (laughs) You know, it like it it goes up and then it goes down. It's like okay, someone cycled that in for some reason and then cycled it out. It was kind of it's the same thing here, but it was specifically coming through Vice. So that's what made me curious. In you know. Right when Ukraine started, read back in 2014, it that's when it became very, very obvious that it wasn't just that Vice was like on the cutting edge of covering this and had really convenient contacts and hookups in Ukraine and Eastern Europe and in Russia. It now seemed like there was an actual program being basically directed from the US State Department or and or the White House to Vice. Like in the same way that we talk about how CNN, you know, is embedded with the White House or takes orders from the State Department when they're when they're covering things, it was basically that, but with Vice. And I remember thinking that this almost seems hard to process. That I'm watching something that seems like, you know, these millennial reporters literally working as like a propaganda apparatus of the Obama administration. But that is exactly what it was. And it was to such an extent where, I mean, the coverage was, I mean, honestly, better. When I say better, I just mean more thorough than other media networks. They had a regular series called Russian Roulette that aired like every day. It was like 45 minutes of, you know, extremely well put together edited footage. They had people like Tim Pool. Uh, streaming live from Euromaidan like every day. And it's like, why are you streaming? Why is Vice streaming live from Euromaidan? Do they know something's about to pop off? Like, what is going on here? The whole thing just seemed like a total setup um, for basically an engineered coup, which is what it was, essentially. And it's just crazy to, to look back on and think, wow, Vice was not just like a participant in this, but they were part of this engine to basically help engineer a coup. And they were there pretending to be like, oh, we're just these like media guys, you know, here. Um, and there's some interesting, you know, I'm, I'm probably sounding a little bit nutty to people who have no idea what we're talking about. Um, but in my movie, I lay some of it out. But I've also subsequently found a lot more information to make the case that I'm describing now. You can actually there's they accidentally left online. I mean, Vice probably forgot that they uploaded like eight hour long live streams to YouTube that are unedited. And you could actually hear the guy talking to his boss or someone basically being told what to and what not to say about the optics of the situation. Um, And specifically, one of the things on one of the streams that they're told not to say is that like the basically these military soldiers that were sort of in the background acting like jerks, they were like acting kind of like fascistic and rough with the people behind them the guy was basically trying to hide during the live stream that they were Ukrainian soldiers. Like he didn't say they were Russian soldiers, but he's like being told literally on the phone uh, not to say they're Ukrainian soldiers. So, you know, who's telling him that vice? Why would, why would the boss's advice care about that? It seems to me that there was a direct line in there. And then we already know that, I mean, Obama, you know, basically produces a vice special uh, about, how the American prison system needs to be reformed. I mean, when has a media network, let alone, I mean, Fox News didn't even do this. Let Bush produce a special about some plan he wanted to roll out. This is what they let Obama do. I mean, yeah. Obama's literally sitting there and it's so fucking ridiculous too. thinking here you are the president talking about what a shame it is that our prison system is so messed up. Well, you're the fucking president. Yeah. Like, it's your fault. Like, do you do something about it? You know, yeah. it's just so weird that that was even aired at all. I mean, I, I tell, I recommend people go watch it just because of how strange it is. Um, yeah. But anyway, yeah, you you brought up the Uyghurs, and that I was literally one of the questions I wanted to ask you was, is the Epoch Times the new Vice News? You know, <laughs> because they're it's like instead of a kind of liberal, edgy. Uh, persona that they're going for epoch times is going from like a more right-wing conservative edgy uh, persona and it's very similar like it's just non-stop coverage of china about the uyghur camps about you know unsubstantiated claims about organ harvesting and all this stuff patrick mcfarlane and i were actually in at freedom fest last week and 
New Tang Dynasty and, or, you know, NTD network or whatever. And uh, Epoch Times both had a booth right next to each other and they were sort of close to us. So I said, Patrick, let's go ask if we can interview someone about the Uyghur genocide going on in China, because I know you know a lot about this. You've done your little documentary. Go If you guys haven't seen Patrick McFarland's documentary on the Uyghur genocide, go check it out. Um, so we went over there and they didn't have anyone who could talk to us, but we noticed every single person, you know, who was running logistics or tech or anything, they were all Chinese, all of them. And then all of their faces, you know, for media, they were all white people. <laughs> and I just thought it was funny. I was like, if anyone thinks this is just like an organic, uh, you know, news organization that just decided to start covering China, and that there isn't an ulterior motive, especially if you look into Falun Gong and their ties to New Tang Dynasty and all that. It, it, it's a very similar thing taking place. And I'm seeing, um, you know, a lot of neoconservatives kind of bleed into the populist right movement with this really anti-Chinese rhetoric, just like they did with the Obama movement and the liberals against Russia. It's very, very similar. So I'm, I, I know you already do, but I mean, isn't it crazy how similar this is? Like, don't you think it's like basically the exact same thing? They're just doing it to the other side now. It is. Um, it is very similar. The only thing that's distinctly different is the propaganda flavor in which is used to get either side to subscribe to either the anti-russian or the anti-china paradigm and the way that they've done it with china i think is very interesting because there was never any aspect of the russia stuff which felt like you know until trump where it was like he's a manchurian candidate it's because of russian disinformation um it never was made to seem like Russia had control over us or, you know, was somehow puppeting us. Right. Right. Um, this is the whole framework of the China thing is it almost fully takes away the agency of the U S empire and the U S government to the point where it's like, no, it's, it's China and the globalists. And, you know, it even bleeds over into some conspiracy people's beliefs and the WEF that sort of controlled the world. And, and, and you even, it's interesting too, you even get it bleeding over into left circles too. Like people like, um, I'm sure you're familiar with Matt Stoller, for mm -hmm. example, who has created this perception that China controls Wall Street. So you have all these different things happening at once that sort of are all coalescing to make, to create this perception that America is cucked, we've lost agency, and now China is not only going to be you know the biggest economy that they already control us completely they even control our movies right right and that's a very interesting thing because it's conservatives are already very sensitive about you know feeling like people are trying to indoctrinate their children that people are trying to censor them so it's like another it's like now a foreign country is trying to control your speech trying to indoctrinate your children maybe even um so it's like i do think it's really playing on some not that i want to say it's more dangerous because being you know the liberals being dangerous and paranoid about russia is obviously very dangerous but i think it's a little more dangerous with what is going on on the right side right now because um it's instilling a lot of paranoia that i think is is even more effective it's let's just say it's more believable uh because china is very powerful it does have a very large reach and economy and relationship with american media companies um and i maybe that's probably ultimately why it's more dangerous to me is because it's more believable and and i think that you know it's clear that there have been many people trying to pivot towards or turn towards china as sort of the next major foreign adversary in whatever this neocon machinery is and you know i think at this point it's going to be really hard to undo this i mean you talked i run into normal people all the time who just echo the china paranoia stuff i mean i'm sure you do too it's it's pretty common now uh didn't used to be 
Um, but it now it is. It's it's kind of almost like household, you know, ch like casual talk. Um, people think China is, you know, is our overlord. Um, and very similarly to how even though Trump was accused of being a Man Manchurian candidate and under the control of Russia, his Ukraine policy was very anti-Russia, <laughs> you know, gave them lots of money, gave them lots of weapons. Uh, there was no way that looking at his policies, you could actually think, oh, wow, this guy is on Russia's side. The same is true with Biden. If you look at Biden's policies, there's nothing about him that makes you think, oh, he's really friendly toward China. You know, he's one of the most hawkish presidents we've had on China in recent history. So they it's just like we were talking earlier with how the neocons would like encourage Obama in the right direction, but then always be talking about what a, you know, a traitor he was for not bombing enough people in the Middle East or whatever. They're doing something very similar with Biden on China, like they did with Trump on Russia, too. Absolutely. I mean, and it's just designed to inch forward you know whatever they want to happen i mean it's it's sort of like not saying these presidents don't have autonomy but it's like they you box you box these things in so that like the only way out is to be more aggressive or to be like no i you know um right. but but back to what you said about how it's similar to vice um the flavor of the propaganda is very different. I think Epic Times is designed to appeal to boomers as well as young people who are a little more reactionary, perhaps. Right. Uh, Vice was meant to appeal, I think, more to young people specifically. And young people, honestly, who weren't even that political um, to kind of get people casually just into culture, somehow in, into politics. Epic Times seems to be more directed at people who are more engaged and are looking for sort of red meat, um, you know, that kind of stuff. And I, and I guess the main similarity to me that really stands out is just like vice Epic times had the luxury of having enough backing financial backing to give out free newspapers, not just in the mailbox, full color printed newspapers, but door to door. I mean, you know, local, your, your local newspaper publisher will do that to try to get you to subscribe. But Epic Times did this nationwide. Like you talk to people who live in major cities and they're like, yep, I got Epic Times like on my doorstep. Like, you know, ev everybody did at a certain point. And interestingly, this actually started happening at the very height at the beginning of the pandemic here when, you know, there weren't real, you know, hardcore lockdowns here. But our version of the lockdowns where they told everybody to stay home, that's when people were getting the epic time. So imagine that heightened atmosphere. People are scared. People are paranoid. People don't want to leave the house. And all of a sudden they get this full color newspaper saying China you know, did the COVID-19 like this, like China released it from a lab. Like that was a lot of people's introduction to the lab leak theory, I would say, was that free epic times um, delivery that probably... I want to say it happened sometime in March, like a couple months after COVID-19 actually broke out. So very clever. And, you know, people don't realize this Fallen Gong is the organization that runs Epic Times. And Fallen Gong is a is a cult. They're an apocalyptic cult that believes in the end of the world. Um, they present themselves as being like practicers of meditation. Uh, in fact, it's not that. They are a very weird culty organization that has very odd beliefs and they're also subsidized by the u.s government and they have been since the 1990s um you know they're they're one of the main go-to's in fact they were before uyghurs became sort of the let's say the tool of you know to gain to get sympathy uh as a workaround to get people to be anti-china fallen gong was originally that you know that sort of representation and then before that it was it was tibet i mean they got young people um and this is kind of vice like actually i mean the tibetan freedom movement the free tibet movement i mean the beastie boys man uh all those 90s alternative mtv musicians were clearly riding off of some kind of cia op of some kind i mean i'm sure they all really legitimately believed in you know the dalai lama and tibet and stuff but it's like 
Adam, what's his face from Beastie Boys? I mean, he was basically probably like one of the CIA's most useful tools for for the anti-China uh, stuff back in the 90s, honestly. Um, yeah. And and I genuinely believe that. I mean, I'm not saying they walked into a CIA recruiting office, but it's like either directly or indirectly, they were really useful um, for that pivot, you know, during the Clinton era. Yeah. Uh, I want to wrap up with this thought. This is something you and I have talked about quite a bit. Um, you know, I obviously don't support the Democrats at all, but the Republicans are in a more vulnerable position to saboteurs. So like to the neocons, to people who are want to hijack anger about how things have been handled the last couple of years. So I think they also have like the most political capital now. I think the Democrats are just going to get wiped out in November. So I'm pleading with people who are on the right and even some libertarians who are going to vote Republican or whatever to be careful about who you're getting on board with and not flushing everything down the toilet because of one single issue. And that's been COVID. You know, COVID has just like ruined a lot of people's brains on both sides. But people will throw everything else aside and just say, well, this guy agreed with me on this one thing. So I'm just going with it. Um, and I think DeSantis is being set up to be the presidential nominee for the Republicans in 2024. Like, I think he's I think he's more popular than Trump or he's going to be like he's Trump without a lot of Trump's, uh, you know, idiosyncrasies or whatever. He's kind of everything they want. He's more polished, but he's still got that kind of brash, tough guy appearance. And he's also got experience in Congress, basically doing whatever the hell the neocons wanted him to do. If you look at his record, it's really bad. This is very rem reminiscent to me of Obama because Obama was good on the Iraq war. You know, he voted against the Iraq war and that was all a ton of people cared about in 2008. They were just like, Bush just, you know, Bush is awful. And anyone who represents his policies has got to go. This young charismatic guy voted the correct way on this one issue. I'm not going to really dig into his record and worry about anything else. I'm just going to go with him on this one thing. I see that happening with DeSantis and a lot of right wingers and a lot of libertarians, unfortunately. I know you and Abby did a whole episode about this phenomenon, but um, you obviously share my concerns. What do you have to say to people who are being blindsided by this? Uh, what words of caution would you give them? I would say that well the, I, i'll try to do it without sounding too conspiratorial um people you know people often would and i think rightfully so would talk about how pete Buttigieg sort of came out of nowhere seemed sort of plucked out of obscurity seemed sort of there to knock bernie off the you know democratic pr primary pedestal and in addition to that had a, a mysterious military record in afghanistan where there's a couple of years where we don't really know what he did. And I think people's intuition when that happens is to sort of be like, well, was he CIA? Was he intelligence? Like that's usually what something like that means. Um, we get a similar flavor with Ron DeSantis's military career. Uh, in fact, it was almost a complete mystery what he did until it was until he started running for governor when he used and touted his being a veteran to try to run for governor and suddenly a bunch of people are like well what did he do there's really almost no information out there and then all of a sudden all these like military commanders came out of the woodwork and they're like oh he was the finest jag officer you know we've ever seen he was he he always followed you know the law to the letter and all this stuff in it i mean and honestly look at some of these media reports they seem kind of like a like a pr op it seems staged like Someone got a bunch of military officers together to tell this nice little story about DeSantis's career that, frankly, is is still a pretty big mystery to me. Um, he also worked at Gitmo, um, and you know, just like uh, George H. W. Bush, um, he got a Yale baseball scholarship, which is a little bit interesting as well. And I, I think what's probably most interesting about Ron DeSantis since he has been in political office has been that he has been pretty much hitting every single hot button 
neocon position, like pro those positions uh, since he's been in Congress and governor, uh, whether it comes to regime change in Cuba, um, Venezuela, um, talking about almost acting as if he has some kind of responsibility to protect our hemisphere. Like, you know, talking as if a governor has some kind of responsibility uh, in foreign policy. Um, he's a huge, uh, you know, promoter of obviously all these like Cuban exiles. Um, and one of the probably the most egregious things for a governor to be talking about all the time is his anti-China rhetoric. I mean, which is, you know, it's not just odd that he talks about China as much as he does, but I think it serves a very clear purpose. And that is not just to normalize it, but to fold in sort of this anti-neocon or sorry, anti-China neocon rhetoric into like basically into populism in a way that has not fully happened yet. You know, you said that Ron DeSantis is sort of Trump without the idiosyncrasies or the things that, you know, actually hurt him. Right. Ron DeSantis, I think, if you could look at this overall, whatever he is, if he's intelligence, whatever, you know, you don't have to think that. He, he seems to serve the purpose of basically bringing back into the world of right populism, normalizing neoconservative beliefs. Um, you know, we already have a lot of right populists already gunning for China, but he's bringing back in all of them. You know, everything that Marco Rubio talks about that sounds neocon. Well, DeSantis talks about all those same things too, but even more hawkishly, and he's right. bringing all that back into the right populist wing of the Republican Party. And on top of all that, he's also waging and very much steering a very significant culture war in the United States. So he's captured a significant amount of attention over this. And coincidentally, not coincidentally, one of the guys he's working with to help propel this extremely intense culture war is a guy named Chris Rufo, who works for a think tank called the Manhattan Institute, which was founded by William Casey, Reagan's CIA director. It's a neocon think tank. Um, and Chris Rufo, you know, has presented himself as this populist who's really going after CRT and rooting out, you know, all the wokeism from from society. But it's kind of odd when you look into his background as well. This guy who's, it's, you know, this really right wing, right populist. Four or five years ago, he was making documentaries about the Uyghurs for PBS, a government funded media organization while living in Xinjiang province in China. So it's a little bit odd to see this guy just sort of appear out of nowhere, becoming the face of this culture war when basically he started as a guy who, you know, would be like one of these neo libs who'd kind of be almost like, is that guy a fed? Cause he was, well, he was like living in Xinjiang doing documentaries about the Uyghur. Like who is this guy? Um, similar thing to Christina Pouchois, the, the uh, press secretary for Ron DeSantis, you know, she's, talking all about the how the libs are paranoid about russia they're crazy they think trump's a russian plant and look how dumb they are and whatever but you know you, you look at that and you'd be like oh yeah she's just saying you know that's how a lot of right populists act right but it turns out that she was actually a representative of a poor a paid representative by sakish billy the basically neocon plant like leader of georgia now, that's really important. I don't talk about Georgia too much in my film, but Georgia was a really pivotal key sort of region for originally sparking off this sort of neocon agenda against Russia. They really tried to inflame that border dispute that happened back, I think, in 2008. Now, Christina Pouchois was an instrumental part of all that stuff. Like, she was actually involved in that machinery to try to get like the u.s to go to war with russia all the way back then and interestingly Ron DeSantis's press secretary was writing articles in georgian saying that trump was like a manchurian russian plant like in like 2016 so you see the magic of this rebranding that happens where you have a guy who making docs about the uyghurs you know, all of a sudden becoming the face of this culture war with Ron DeSantis in a 
basically like a full on Russia gator who was doing things that are arguably also intelligence agency, like becoming Ron DeSantis's spokesperson. Um, it's just, it's just very, very strange. And you, you can't really make this stuff up. I mean, you know, I even, I wish I could have gone into Russia gating my film. Cause I still think that, you know, Washington free beacon, the, the neoconservative outlet, uh, that originally funded fusion GPS, uh, was responsible for the steel dossier but somehow we're all under this impression now that oh no they stopped they just passed the baton to the clinton campaign it's like no they, of course they didn't do that i know that these neocons who were involved in washington free beacon were on this russia conspiracy stuff years before you really think that they're just gonna pass the the baton on to the clinton campaign and the clinton campaign on their own is gonna come up with this of course not this was all being set up so you know, it's just fascinating because it's like you can see in retrospect that the Republican Party essentially made good with those neocons in Washington Free Beacon and uh, the person who runs that outlet, uh, Paul Singer. Uh, he actually visited the White House a few months after Trump got in office. And after that, you never heard any talk from the, any of the Republicans about Washington Free Beacon ever again. Up until that point, up until Paul Singer visits the White House. You can see a lot of Republicans being like, wait a second, these guys did the Steele dossier. <clears throat> and do I have any examples of that? <clears throat> yes. Steve Bannon himself is on tape on a Breitbart interview being like, it wasn't the Clinton campaign. It was the Washington Free Beacon. They paid for Fusion GPS. They did the Steele dossier. He's saying this on tape. And it's clear that that, I mean, I think that that is probably one of the most truthful moments he's ever had. So Things are not as black and white as people think. It wasn't just the Democrats trying to undermine, you know, the right. Trump campaign and tar with Russia. It was a whole system of people. And the neocons were deeply involved. And when I said the neocons, I mean, some of them who, who now present themselves as right populists. So, um, yeah, it's a whole it's a whole convoluted web. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know you got to get going here soon. Uh, thanks for joining me. We'll have to have another discussion sometime. I, I really like the way you think and the way you look at things. So we'll do this again. Where do you want people to follow you and keep up with your work? Well, thanks for having me on, Reed. Yeah, it was a great conversation. I'd, I'd love to come on again. Um, you can check out my stuff. Uh, if you want to actually check out the film, uh, you can go to a veryheavyagenda.com. Um, part two of the film is streaming for free on YouTube. Uh, if you just want to go there and watch it, um, it's probably the, probably the best one that can act as a standalone film. Although it obviously does help to watch part one and three. Um, and yeah, you can follow me on Twitter, um, at fluorescent gray. All right, guys. And I have those linked in the description so you can go check all those out. Um, I will be streaming again on, I think, Sunday around noon and then in the evening. Please subscribe to me on all the platforms I'm on uh, and check out my merchandise at toplobster.com. And we will catch you guys on the next stream.